has anyone else in the panel, um, either the other professors or uh, modelled this at all? So because you, you've been very clear about the number of school days that you think will be made up and stop being lost, but I just want to understand if you've also made that calculation as well. So there are two separate elements to this, Janice, and it's a really obviously a very critical question. The first thing is, of course, you're not comparing a child being vaccinated against nothing happening. You're comparing a child being vaccinated against a near certainty that child will get COVID. So that, that's the correct comparison, not against nothing. And under that environment, actually, our estimate is probably you would uh, have fewer days lost as a result of being vaccinated compared to allowing people to be infected because some children will have significant symptoms and we, we would expect a child who was actually infected uh, not to be at school. So uh, in, in that sense, that comparison goes in favour of the vaccine. And we then looked very specifically at the broader question about what would happen in terms of disruption. There is some modelling which is online and we've put links to it uh, uh, online uh, at the very lowest level. Uh, and this is assuming really, in my view, quite optimistic numbers. There was an assumption that, we, the, that vaccination would probably reduce uh, by about 110,000 uh, days. Come, we're we're going to come on to okay, that. But, that. But, but, but much higher numbers will be to have significant yeah. surges subsequently. But, but what I'm asking is, what are the day, the modelling on the days potentially lost for, as the JCVI says, short-term disruption, but also but also if there are side effects. So you must have done that modelling alongside the, the modelling which you've just pointed out. I'll, I'll, talk, I'll ask Dr. Professor Van Tam to come back on yeah. this, but our view is, is firmly that uh, people who have an infection are likely to be off school for longer than people who have a vaccination on average. Right. And therefore, since virtually any child unvaccinated from, is likely to get an infection at some point between 12 and 15, uh, that is the correct comparison, not against nothing. And that's a really key point. Professor Van Tam, do you want to add to that? I think there's very little I would add to that other than to support it and to say that we are talking here about the first dose of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. And I think it is very clear from the extant data collected by the MHRA and others that the um, side effects associated with the first dose of the um, Pfizer vaccine are lower than the second. And uh, did, Camilla, you were looking at me. Was there anything you wanted to say on that or not? No, no, no thank okay. you. Um, just finally, um, for now, before I pass over to um, Dr. Caroline Johnson, can I just ask you um, about the issue of um, the right to a private life. We know that the ask later of the ECHR protects the right to a private life and it's an individual's right to confidentiality that includes an individual right to confidentiality in terms of the respect of health and medical treatment. If vaccinations are carried out in school, how will you, uh, will there be a guarantee that confidentiality will be maintained and that those who choose not to for one reason or another um, there won't be any kind of vaccine favouritism or they won't be stigmatised in any way for not uh, going ahead in, with that. And will you publish guidance so that you ensure that each child's right to make their own confidential decision um, as to whether or not the vaccine, uh, to have the vaccination is respected? And I suggest that um, uh, Dr Kingdom and then Professor uh, Sir Keith Willett answer that because they're much more involved in this. My general point would be that the Chief Medical Officers were clear that the views of uh, families should be respected uh, and no one should be stigmatised in either direction. Dr Kingdom. Um, yes, yeah, so I w I, Pro Professor Whitty has um, essentially outlined exactly um, our view on this. I mean, we've been very clear from a Royal College perspective that whatever choice a child makes or whatever choice a family makes, that there should be no judgment attached to it. Um, and that we would expect that um, children who, and families who decide not to take up this offer um, you know, are able to participate in a full range of activities and, and that their, their um, but decision also be, is respected. But it would also be kept confidential. Well, so in the school's immunisations programme, uh, which delivers a, a, a number of other vaccines, uh, the, these processes are you know, well tested. Uh, now clearly the, the process around this vaccine is slightly different 
yes. um, because of some of the practical issues that we've already discussed. Um, but we would be, I mean, and, and you know, um, Professor Willett will, um, I'm sure, go into some detail about this. But um, there is no reason to expect that um, any privacy would be um, overcome. And and. Um I'm going to, Professor, oh, so both professors, I think. I think we'll start with Professor Willett first, because I think he was specifically referred to by Professor Witte and then um, Professor Van Tam. And then I'll bring in Tom briefly on this point, and then we bring Caroline Johnson. Um, please, uh, Keith. Yes, thank you, Chair. So perhaps I think the, the context uh, just needs to be set around the school age immunisation services that are used. So um, once we receive a direction from the Secretary of State, to mobilise an immunisation programme through the, what's called the commissioning intentions under Section 7A, um, we institute a process to do that. Now, in England, we have chosen to use the established and well tried and tested uh, programme of using school age immunisation services. Uh, these, as um, Professor Kingdom has indicated, uh, are well established and lead other vaccination programmes. And it's important to just understand that they are school age immunisation services and not school services. And that means when we commission them through our regional NHS England teams, we commission them to vaccinate or to offer vaccination to all school age children, whether they're in mainstream education, whether they're in other environments, detained settings, in child mental health units, um, whether they're home educated or whatever. So that's important. And these school programs have been running for a long time with very professional, experienced, trained healthcare professional staff. And they go through a process. So consent is not an event. It is a process um, which involves the school uh, immunization services contacting and working with the school, um, working with the school to get information out to the parents and to okay. the children, which is appropriate information. And that's an important part of the consent process. Um, the school also provides the school immunization service with the okay. contact can, can, details. Can I just of, interrupt, because we've got lots to get through, but what I'm talking about is confidentiality. We'll come on to consent in a bit, but what okay. I'm talking about is confidentiality. So there is, there is no, will be no breach in confidentiality as has already been explained. Okay. Um, this is done as a closed service, which is commissioned by the NHS. Thank you. Thank you. And Professor Van Tam, and then I'll bring in Tom. Chair, you asked about dis potential discriminatory behaviour uh, based on whether a child had or had not received um, a COVID-19 vaccine. Um, accepting that the processes are slightly different, the UK has been um, immunising children school, of school age against um, another respiratory virus, influenza, for more than a decade. And I have never once heard of any differential or discriminatory treatment of children according to whether they had or had not had the live attenuated influenza vaccine nasal spray um, delivered by the school immunisation service. So. Um, Whilst I understand the theoretical um, question you are raising, I believe I'm extremely reassured personally by the extreme competence of the system to have avoided that um, for at least a decade in terms of influenza immunisation. Thank you. Um, Tom. Thank you, Chair. Um, we've I mean, heard a lot so far about, you know, obviously, clearly the benefits that having the vaccine can provide for the 12 to 15 um, age group. We've also heard about transmission and how potentially with the Delta there's less of an effect, but still some effect. Um, I could see how it's conceivable how 12 to 15 year olds having a vaccine could provide wider societal benefits beyond just that age group. To what extent was your recommendation, was it your recommendation solely about welfare of 12 to 15 year olds, both in terms of mental health, education, and also threat of the virus, or what did it, to some extent take into account what's in the best interest of wider society and potentially those in other age groups? So you're, really key question and the answer, the, the CMOs were really clear that the only uh, evidence they would consider was things that directly or indirectly were beneficial or disbeneficial, problematic to children 12 to 15. No other age group, so we only consider that age group. The, there may well be wider societal benefits, they were not part of our considerations at all. And we've not mentioned them in any of our arguments one way or the other. We've st stuck strictly to that age group. I guess sometimes it can be, it can be quite a bit complicated, though, because, for example, 
if by having the vaccine, 12 to 15 year olds were less likely to transmit the virus to somebody who may be vulnerable to COVID and hasn't had a vaccine, that could prevent pressure being put on the NHS, but could actually, we, we hope not, but lead to a situation where it could be more disruption to education. So I guess sometimes it's quite difficult to, to entirely distangle what's in the interest of the 12 to 15 year olds, education disruption and also what- You were right, but we, 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 we actually construct our own views very narrowly now, the exception to that was actually a decision that JCV had already made, which is that where a 12 to 15-year-old child was living with a, uh, and Professor uh, Lim can expand on this if you want, was living with uh, someone, child or adult, who was highly immunosuppressed or had very significant risks, then offering vaccination. This is an advance of our views, was a reasonable thing to do in that very narrow within a family. But actually, more widely, we kept entirely to benefits to the 12 to 15 year old age uh, and left all the other theoretical potential benefits out of the equation for because we think consider that was the right ethical uh, framework. Uh, Professor Van Tam, if you just answer briefly before I come on to Caroline, thank you. Yeah, so I would um, add to that to say that um, uh, our terms of reference were very, very clear, written down and agreed on that and they are as Professor Whitty says. I was also, of course, in a great many of the meetings where um, the breadth of the medical profession offered their views. And I can say categorically that if ever their views strayed into, and there would also be you know, uh, knock-on effects in X, Y, and Z groups, uh, there was a very, very clear and deliberate suppression of those views to say, that's fine, that may well be a valid view and an important point, but we are not considering it in any way, shape or form in terms of our deliberations. And I'm very categorical about what I heard and how I heard those being um, dismissed in the sense of the uh, considerations of the UK CMOs. And you should hear that from me as a witness. Thank you. Um, Caroline. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for coming today for this. I should declare an interest, first of all, in that I'm a member of the Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health as a practising paediatrician. Um, I wanted to ask you a question slightly obliquely related to this, first of all, please, Professor Whitty. Um, as part of my um, reading around this, I found that um, Professor Viner and Dr Smith and others had researched the, um, th the cases of the um, 61 children who sadly died in the first year of the pandemic within 28 days of a positive coronavirus test. And they found that of those, 25 or just under 41% of those had died of coronavirus and the remaining 60%-ish had died of other causes but had a positive test at the time of death. Um, there's been lots of speculation about the accuracy of the death figures that are on the news each night. Do you think that 40-60 split is representative of the adult population were it to be so thoroughly reviewed as the child population has been. Thank you. I mean, I think that uh, on, the, on those particular numbers, I think it also might be worth getting a view from uh, Dr Kingdom on the, on the paediatric side. Um, what we can see around the world is that people both overcount and undercount COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that um, some cases of COVID are going to be missed, and indeed we know that some people are dying of COVID who are not recorded as COVID. That's true in every country. Uh, the UK, I think, is actually better than average at picking them up, but I think we still miss them. Mm -hmm. We also know that there will be people who will come in with a positive COVID test and genuinely have COVID, but in fact, that is not the reason why they've died. But you have to have a definition, and the case definition we currently have of 28 days is considered to be a reasonable compromise, accepting there will be some people either way. But I've said very firmly from the very beginning of this epidemic, right back at the beginning of last year, Ultimately, the most important uh, measure is actually all-cause excess mortality. So you don't, in a sense, you take the uh, mistakes that are made in diagnosis in either direction out of the equation. You also take into account the indirect effects of COVID, which are very important. And excess mortality uh, numbers around the world look quite different from the COVID numbers. And in most countries, they're actually higher. Uh, mm -hmm. In the UK, they roughly uh, equate, although the... the, the so, uh, at the moment, they're running slightly lower. But I would, I would urge people in the long run, not immediately, but in the long run, I do think all-cause excess mortality is the key metric. Thank you. Um, another question. Um, you've been very clear in the various briefings that you've done in number 10 for the media throughout the pandemic. Can I ask you, um, was the decision that you made on children's vaccines entirely a medical decision? 
and not either political or influenced by politicians. Yes, I can, ca- I can categorically say that. There is no point in asking for a professional advice, and you as a doctor will completely accept this, uh, yeah. if you then uh, take into account extraneous things. Ministers ask us for a professional view, and we give them a professional view. They then have an important political step, which is their decision. We mm-hmm. hand our, our professional advice over. So our professional advice is completely medical. OK. Um, so you, you said... Um, the reasons that were given for children getting their vaccines were the mental health, two, but the first one, if we do them first, the first one was the mental health benefits knowing that you, um, that come with knowing you're protected from this deadly virus. Okay, and that was stated by the minister in his um, statement to the house and also by the health minister yesterday. Um, why do children need vaccinating to protect them from fear of something that is so unlikely to harm them? Well, can I actually, on a minute, I'm going to ask Dr. Kingdom to comment on that, but can I be very clear? <laughs> and in fact, it goes back to your last question. I, I am responsible for what I write and say. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't consider that uh, you should assume that exactly what ministers say is exactly what we have advised. Our advice was written down extremely clearly, and it started off with the physical benefits identified by JCVI, went on to the wider benefits of public health from a public health point of view of education, and also then went on to, as a third uh, line, some of the points which were made very forcefully to us, to be clear, by general practitioners, by public health people, by paediatricians, uh, uh, as part of our evidence gathering. But I'd really like to uh, ask Dr Kingdom to comment on But I want to be clear, you know, you don't please assume that what I say is what a minister thinks, and equally don't assume that what a minister says is what I think. Those two are separate sets of uh, uh, issues. So the reason given, which was quoted by, by Mr Zahawi and also by um, Magatrip yesterday, was mental health benefits that come with knowing you're protected from this deadly virus. Now, um, presumably the best way to protect a child from, from, from such thoughts is to reassure them you know, that they're not at huge de- risk of dying of this, of this, of this virus, which is da- undoubtedly deadly, but almost certainly not to a healthy child. Um, so are you saying that you would not consider that a reason for vaccination? I, what, I'm, what I think you're implying is that the uh, ordering, which you're quoting a minister of saying, is the same as the way we've done it. What I've done is laid out what is our professional view is, and I'd really like Dr Kingdom maybe to comment well, we'll come, as, come as a paediatrician on it, this. But it's, it's based on what your advice is. Um, and it, and it, it was your advice on which the government made its decision um, with respect. <laughs> but but, but, <laughs> but, but, but um, or, well, with respect. Uh, the, uh, the advice we gave is written down extremely clearly with the logic laid out. Okay. Mental health is one element of that, an important one. Which mental, health, mental health is, is important, I agree with that. Um, sorry to interrupt you, but the mental health benefits that come with knowing you're protected from a deadly virus, is that one of your reasons or is it not? No. That is, an un, un, that, is a, that is, in a sense, a simplification of a much wider point, and I think Dr Kingdom is in a much better position to lay out what we actually meant. Dr Kingdom. Um, thank you. So, uh, you know, I think it's important that we do talk about the mental health consequences of this pandemic because, you know, fortunately, children have been very minimally affected. I mean, you know, tragically, there have been a small number of deaths, and, and there, in addition, there have been a small number of children who've been very ill, but the vast majority um, have been mildly or, in fact, entirely asymptomatically affected by um, the, the virus. But where we've seen the bulk of the impact from the pandemic mm-hmm. is around mental health, lost educational opportunities, some of the anxiety that goes with, with the disruption to life because of schools not happening and so on. And so um, I think if we, if, if we think about mental health in the broadest sense, then um, you know, providing reassurance to children, um, you know, not, you know, yes, it's a deadly virus globally, but it's not a deadly virus to children. So the kind of clarity of messaging um, is extremely important. And in fact, in the soundings we've taken from children and young people through the Royal College, because we have about a thousand children that we work with and, and, you know, form views with and and, and test some of these ideas with, is the idea one of their most consistent messages to us has been around saying we want clear information we don't want this sugar-coated but we want to understand actually what the issues are for us Um, because actually the absence of clear information plays into kind of the anxiety and stress um, and disruption to normal life that children have experienced for the last 18 months thank you i was going to get this question later on but it's probably a good time to come to it now actually Um, you wrote a letter to all members of Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health, which, of which I've said I'm one. Um, and as part of that, you've suggested that children 
um, should not be tested if they're asymptomatic. So at the moment, children, unlike adults, are being tested routinely in school. My daughter will be having her COVID test today, her lateral flow test, um, as she does twice weekly. And um, you suggested that that is stopped. Does that contribute to children's anxiety, that regular testing? And can you elaborate on why you think regular testing of asymptomatic children should be stopped? So um, I, I should stress that this is a view of the Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health that you know this is not um, something that fellow panellists may, may necessarily agree with. But, but it's our view that um, because children are so, you know, so unlikely to be seriously affected by the viral infection, mm -hmm. that anything we can do to just give them back their normal lives, which, let's face it, having a, a swab shoved up your nose twice a week is not part of a, no a normal life for a child. And, and actually, there are an awful lot of children who, frankly, loathe the experience. So um, we, we, we are very much wanting to move as paediatricians towards a place where SARS-CoV-2 is treated like other viral infections that affect children. Because actually, in our experience, we're not seeing problems from COVID infection to any greater extent compared to other viral infections. And so we, we ultimately would like to move to a position where actually, you know, if your child's ill, they stay at home, regardless of what's caused that uh, state of unwellness, whereas if they're well, they go to school. And that if we can get back into that, so hence why we've put it out there that we would like to suggest a review of some of the, um, the, the, the measures that are currently in place in schools um, around particularly, um, you know, COVID-19. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, the other thing I wanted to look at was the second reason that was given for um, prevention, uh, for, for vaccinating children, which was about the um, disruption to education. And it, in some ways, the figures have been slightly confused. You, you, you said a moment ago that it was near certainty that children would, would, get, would get it. Now, um, what proportion of children do you think have already had it? I know the ONS has esti estimated recently 50 to 70%, but what's your estimate of it, perhaps? You know, I, it varies, it varies by age, um, uh, and it does also vary by setting. But I think uh, if we go for roughly half, I think that is a reasonable uh, stab at this. Uh, but, uh, but that obviously means you've then got half who, who, you know, that's half over the period of the entire uh, epidemic to date. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we've got quite a way to run. We're running into winter. So there's quite, still quite a lot uh, mm -hmm. of the damage that could be done to, in terms of disruption. You said there's a near certainty they would get it, but the estimates that you've published on the gov.uk website of the effects of the vaccine um, is that if the children were vaccinated to prevent 40 to 60,000 cases. So I appreciate you're, you're assuming in that that you get 60% vaccination, so there's a potential for that to increase. But you're talking about one and a half million children in, in this age group that have not had the disease already. So why is there such a big discrepancy between those two numbers? Uh, well, what, what we're assuming is, firstly, that the vaccines are not fully effective for the reasons uh, Professor Lin was talking on. Mm -hmm. And secondly, we're assuming, and if you're talking about, you're, if, I'm assuming you're talking about the modelling uh, papers that have been done yeah, here. Yeah, so you're saying you've we, got three million children, of which one and a half million children have already had it, and so arguably the vaccines don't really help them at all. So you've got one... Uh, no, that's not actually... Well, that's, that, let's come back to that. That's, a, that's not actually strictly true, but... Entirely. Uh, OK. So, so there's, there's a group of people who've not had it who... I mean, let's make an assumption that the great majority of children who have not currently had COVID are going to get it at some point over the next period. It won't be necessarily in the next two or three months, but they will get it sooner or later, because this is incredibly infectious. Uh, mm -hmm. And because immunity wanes, we're not going to see a situation where it just sort of stops at mm -hmm. a certain point. So over the next uh, years, we will see that happening. Now, vaccination will reduce that risk, mm -hmm. uh, as Professor Lin was saying, by, I'm going to say for the sake of argument, 50%. It's probably slightly more than that, but 50% uh, for the sake of argument. Uh, people who've already had the infection, some of them will go on to get it a second time, that we know, uh, and so the vaccination will further reduce that number, and it won't produce a complete protection for those uh, who are vaccinated, and there'll be some people, who, so, uh, there's some people who won't even get infected at all, but there will be a really very small number. You, know, you can put a lot of different assumptions into this, and the bit that we don't know most, and the one that's going to have the biggest impact, I think, in the medium to long term, is how rapidly uh, does this wane in terms of protection, assuming no new variant, and that's a very, very important assumption, but assuming no new variant, that probably is the thing we don't, we don't know most. So the confidence intervals around almost all of the numbers are really quite wide. So we can give broad indications 
uh, of this. But I think with all of these, and the modelers would agree with this, no one should put too much emphasis on individual numbers. I think you have to see them as, as a sort of central projection within quite a wide range. Just, you, just, you, just one second, just on the natural immunity, um, how, how soon does that, you said that wanes, how, how soon does that wane compared to the vaccine? In, in children, my view is we do not yet know. Uh, I would anticipate that vaccines and uh, natu natural immunity in the sense of you got infected, let us assume, will be broadly similar. I would secondly assume that it will take longer probably to wane in children than in older adults, uh, just because we know that older adults things tend to wane. But that's, that's an assumption. Both of those may be untrue. I'd be interested in uh, Camilla's view on this, uh, and also Wei Shen's. But I don't think we should assume that either having had an infection or indeed having been vaccinated provides full long-term protection. I think that would be optimistic based on what we know from other areas. Wei Shen, do you want to add to that? Yeah, thanks. So there was a trial, there has been a trial down in children, and when they estimated the numbers uh, of the amount of protection in children who were naturally infected alone, uh, it was about 70% protection. So I would suggest that if somebody has been naturally infected, then they get 70% protection. In terms of waning duration, uh, in adults, uh, we know they're well protected for six to nine months, and there's Professor Witte says it's likely to be as good as, if not longer, for children. Do you want to add to that? No. Sorry. Um, no, I mean, I, th I think that's right. I think, I, th I think we're confident that children mount an, an exceptionally good immune response, so probably on the nine month end of the spectrum rather than the six. Given that children, you, you talked about they can get it again, they can, people can have cases to direct positive, but we also know that most children are asymptomatic. And we know that some viruses can be carried in the noses of healthy people. All, all the time, and Enterococcus is, is an example of bacteria that does so. Um, so how do you know whether you're picking up a case or a carriage in those children? I don't think, so I think that, uh, and I, I'm going to try and explain this, I, not in a, you, you'll understand this, I'm going to try and do it in a simpler <laughs> language just, just to make it, because obviously the people we're really sense trying to talk to through you are families. Uh, so what Dr. Johnson is talking about is there are some infections, and meningococcus, which she talked about, is an important one, which people can carry in their noses for really quite prolonged periods of time. Uh, but without, in most cases, causing problems, but in a very small number, they can cause very severe problems, and that's it's a very different sort of disease. Mm. We don't think it is likely, at least my view is, we're not going to have immunocompetent children, so children who've got a normal immune system, carrying this virus and continuing to excrete for long periods of time. We expect them to have it for relatively short periods of time, and then their immune system will deal with it, and they won't be excreting at that point. They will no longer have the virus. But then at some later stage, uh, the immune system uh, will be weakened to the degree that they can get a further infection. Now, I'm simplifying a very complicated area, which you'll fully understand, but, but broadly, this is not one of those things where you expect it to have long-term carriage in the way that some other infections have long-term carriage, is my view. Okay, I wanted to drill down, if I can, if the chair will allow me, on education and the educational disruption. Um, you took evidence on the fact that if you have severe educational disruption, <coughs> that that has mental health and social disbenefits to children, educational disbenefits to children. Yeah. That much is sort of, to an extent, obvious, right? Um, what evidence did you have on the scale relative to the number of days missed? Because we know that there are many children who will be taken voluntarily by their parents on a week's holiday every year, and that some children will have Ill other illnesses that keep them out of school for a week or more each year. Now, if we have 3, 000, 3 million children in this group, of which half have already had it, and some won't get it, some might get it again, but roughly speaking, half, one and a half million children could get it eventually, and they would have to have 10 days isolation. Two of those would be a, weekday, a weekend day, even if they all caught it at the beginning of a term and the beginning of a week. They, most they would have is eight days off school. So the average then must be less than four days, even if all the children get it at the beginning of a week in the, in this, in the early part of a school term which they weren't. So what evidence did you have that four days of educational disruption is enough to cause children significant enough damage? Well, I think that one of the things um, which makes this difficult is that the uh, disruption does not just occur because an individual child has got infected and then for a period after, although that clearly can happen if people are symptomatic, and I mm. uh, note the point that uh, uh, Dr. Kingdon made earlier. Um, but it also happens when you get outbreaks in schools. And I think I'm sure that every member of this committee, which is, after all, the Education Committee, is aware of evidence that when outbreaks happen in schools, right, that I causes disruption. Pardon, we're going to have to go and vote. Yeah. Um, 
So I do apologise. <laughs> we'll come back as soon as we can. This is it. This is a, a spat between the Scottish National Party and the government, so we're keeping it. in the socket. So if I use my earphones, that wouldn't disable the microphone? No. Okay, fine. I might have to bring my own earphones in that case, you know. Yes. The beauty of being able to use my own earphones is you'll not be able to tell or not whether I'm listening to Iggy Pop. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
Hello, Professor Wedding. Can I just ask you a, a question? I mean, from your perspective, how important is it for you to have an understanding of how many youngsters are vaccinated? Have COVID already? Well, I think that um, the, the advantages to the child who's growing up COVID being vaccinated, who's getting vaccinated, are different to the advantages if they are not being vaccinated. Right. The, the bigger degree of protection is children who've not been vaccinated. Who've not, who've not Clearly. Uh, on, on the other hand, if you have a vaccine on top of having had COVID, you're probably going to manage an extremely strong immune response that may last for a long period of time. So, I mean, the immune is, uh, you know, though the principal aim is to protect people, children who have not had COVID, I think that is, is, you know, there are some advantages. So, so would, would, a, would, 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 yeah, I mean, a lateral flow test wouldn't show this up, but a PCR test would that show if um, as previously had? No, you, the PCR test, which is tells you whether you've got COVID at the moment. Yeah. Right. But in terms of the monitoring, you have to do a blood test, blood and test. A, uh, a serology test that will tell you whether you've previously had it. So, so have you not considered from that perspective in terms of having a better understanding of how many youngsters have had it or have done some sample testing? Yes, yeah, so, so there are some good studies that have done exactly that, um, which have looked at random samples. had it it varies a lot by geography and age uh, but that was as i was saying with dr johnson this is something which we think roughly half children have but it is it is variable around the country right. but of course if we were to try and do it on an individual child basis we'd be having to bleed all those children and then vaccinate them which seems a doesn't seem to us a sensible thing to do okay <laughs> yes. yeah we, we, we don't what we don't want to end up with our kids looking like pin cushions do we? <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, in my patch and gate said, you know, we've been like right at the top of the league in terms of in infection, you know, and, and, and then there's been other times when we've got it right under control and we've been down much lower than the national average. So, uh, I think your public health people have been absolutely fantastic. Al really Alice is excellent. Yeah. Uh, Alice Wiseman is absolutely excellent. I can vouch for her completely. She's a good lass. Uh, but she's actually become a bit of a TV star as well in the northeast of England. So, yes. Good. Good. And it was Alice and her colleagues, people like that, who were giving us evidence directly or indirectly that helped us to understand the scale of the problem we're trying to yeah. deal with. Yeah. Do you think doing that now? I mean, it's, it's funny in my patch, I've actually got um, Alice, who I knew her dad quite well about 30 years ago. and. And, and the, the new director of public health in Sunderland, um, I held her in my arms as, as a baby. Best friend's sister. Okay, we'll wait till all members come back. Apologise. Yeah. It's important that.
Okay, um, thank you. Um, order, order. Are you ready to re resume oh, it? Are we okay? Uh, okay, thank you. Um, Caroline, can you resume your questioning, please? Okay, um, thank you. Um, so we're talking about the educational disruption and the evidence that you had for the educational disruption. Um, did you have any thoughts before you went into the um, evidence gathering process on what level of disruption would be considered harmful? and what level of disruption would cause minimum difficulties. Um, presumably having five minutes out of the classroom isn't going to cause huge problems. Having a whole year out would clearly cause significant problems. What, at what level do you think the disruption becomes significant to a child's mental or educational or physical well-being? Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Johnson. Uh, I think the first thing to say is that the disruption is not, if it was spread thinly and evenly across the whole country at all times, it's a very different situation to if it is highly concentrated in particular areas mm -hmm. or if it happens to children who are, uh, whose parents are unable to su support them in, uh, in home or who are pre-existing, for example, uh, mental uh, uh, conditions or stresses. These are not, there's no such thing as the average child. And I think that's the first really important thing to start on. We are talking on. about healthy children here, aren't we? But nevertheless, this is healthy in the narrow sense of not at high risk of dying from COVID. That's, they're still talking about children across the board uh, on this. Uh, and the evidence we got very powerfully from our colleagues from general practice, from paediatrics, from mental health, uh, and from public health, really powerfully, was this is having a really substantial impact, particularly in areas of deprivation, uh, particularly in certain groups in society mm -hmm. and particularly on children who had pre-existing uh, stresses and other issues. And so this is not an average mm -hmm. issue. This is something where it can ha actually be catastrophic for some children and of really very, un very limited importance to others. So it's important not to try and average the children out. I think that's a misunderstanding. Uh, Dr. Kingdom, you might want to add to that? Yes, I, I, mean, I, th I think I would say that, you know, I think the children of, of the UK are incredibly resilient. But I think what we've seen in the past 18 months, that actually with the level of disruption to their lives, the kind of uncertainty that um, the pandemic has brought upon them in as much as, you know, you think you're going to go to school on Monday and then you get a message at, just before you set off, just after you've left, to say actually somebody's tested positive, everyone's moving home. The kind of the level of disruption has led to a, a raised level of anxiety amongst all our children. and then. You know, we know from, from our mental health colleagues that some children have been very badly affected mm -hmm. by this. So I think, um, I don't think, uh, you know, I, I have, have no doubt that you, you will have seen this yourself. You, you know, I think the, the uncertainty and the anxiety that, 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 that has been brought upon our children is, should not be underestimated. Mm -hmm. and, and as Professor Whitty said, it's particularly the case in children where, living in the kind of the lowest socioeconomic groups, where the ability to do homeschooling um, has been nigh impossible, um, where actually they have lost you know, significant chunks of their education, which translates into an alteration in life chances. No, I, I quite agree that you know, the, the last 12 months has been extremely difficult for children. The difference between last year and this year is that the government has removed the need for bubbles, and it's removed the need for children under the age of 18 and a half, which is basically school children, and certainly all of the children in the 12 to 15 year old age group. It's removed the requirement for them to isolate unless they personally have tested positive. So the level of disruption that we have seen over the previous 12 months, over the previous school year, should not be seen again unless, you know, unless the government wants to change the rules, I guess. Um, <clears throat> so is there any evidence under the current rules, which is presumably what you've looked at, the current rules, yeah, you're nodding. Um, is there any evidence on the current rules of how much disruption it would, it would be? And what evidence did you have? You know, the children have, as you said, experienced quite wide-ranging different amounts of disruption over the last 12 months. Have you looked at the, the level of disruption versus the effect on their mental and physical well-being? So the correct, obviously, the correct thing to compare this to is if COVID wasn't there at all, and mm -hmm. then the difference you'd actually get with vaccination. We've looked at this as best we can, mm -hmm. with very strong and powerful testimony from all around the country, all four nations of the UK, from all of our professional colleagues. And what they've all said is, in some areas, the disruption has been repeated, and if there's even small amounts more, the impact of that could be very substantial. In others, much less so. This is not an, this is not an evening out kind of situation. In terms of we have, model, we have had modelling done uh, as part of this process, and the range they came to was from the most benign situation, which I think is uh, actually 
very improbable, of 110,000 uh, days of schooling lost uh, compared to if there's no vaccination, up to a higher end, which is not the absolute top of the end of the range, of 12 million days of schooling lost if we were to have a significant surge over winter. Now, we, no, now I do not know, you do not know, and nobody knows exactly what kind of surges we're going to have in in, over time and how we will have to respond to them. But I think what this does do is it provides an insurance policy to reduce, not eliminate by any means, but to reduce significantly the impact this, that any significant surge would have. And even at the current level, I would be surprised if any of the people on this committee can say that in their constituencies there is no disruption, even at the current levels. If you can, please say, but that is actually not our experience. And this is from around the country and from very, uh, very well plugged in professional colleagues. That's, that doesn't really answer my question if, if, with respect. So what I'm trying to get at is you've, you've talked about the scale of the difference being you know, between what is effectively 15 minutes per child, which is less than the time it's going to take them to have the vaccine, which is the, the figure you've given of 110 thousand um, days lost to um, 12 million which would assume that all children who haven't had it all got it at the beginning of a week and didn't and they had about average of four days off each effectively um, so is what evidence do you have that having those four days off is damaging what evidence do you have medically on who's looked at how much disruption equals how much harm because there must be examples of schools when very few people had it very much time off and other children who've had more time off. Who has done a research looking at those different children and how much effect it has, and how did that inform your decision that this disruption of between 15 minutes and four days on average for an average child and 10 days maximum for, for, for any child effectively um, would cause enough damage to their childhood to require them to have a vaccine? So I think that uh, the first thing to say uh, pretty clearly is we don't assume that the only disruption is to a child who is infected at that moment. That is not the experience, certainly of GPs, certainly of public health people working across the country. And I think to assume that that is somehow it's only those children who be affected, whatever government says, I think is to misunderstand what the lived experience of schools around the country, firstly. Secondly, what is really clear to us mm. is that, this, that the pandemic is at its most dangerous in the areas of deprivation. You don't only have to look at a map to actually see that. Mm -hmm. It has been consistently and it will be consistently. And that those are the areas where the greatest educational advantage is had from people being in schools and where families are least able to support children at home because they may be doing jobs which don't allow them to work from home. So I think this idea that you somehow spread the amount out averagely across the thing and then it seems reasonable mm -hmm. is to misunderstand how heavily concentrated the disadvantage of this educational disruption has been, particularly on the most disadvantaged children and in particularly in the most disadvantaged areas. And that really has got to be fundamental to the understanding of why this is important. And this is why really not, powerful testimony from across our profession. You can wrap up, Caroline. So why not vaccinate just those children? Well, why, 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 why? So I, I guess you know we know that children from black and ethnic minority groups are more at risk from COVID. We know that boys are more at risk of myocarditis, and we know that um, quite a lot of children, half of them, have already had it already. So if you're one of the hundreds of thousands of uh, white boys, for example, who've had it already, is the vaccine still a good idea for you? Well, I mean, you could do a theoretical thing where you say, if you're a middle-class white boy, we'll do a blood test, work out if you've got serology positive. If you are, we won't do a vaccination. Mm. I'm not convinced that feels to me like an effective public health intervention. And what we really wanted to do was build on what JCVI said. There is still benefit over over uh, benefit of vaccination over uh, that harm. That child? Yeah, for every individual child, on average. Uh, yeah, before you get on to education. You want to, sp you want to spread everything out for, for, for those children? No, what, for what I'm just saying is, yeah, what, to, to see, be in a situation where we say we're not going to offer, and the key word here is offer, this is a voluntary thing, mm -hmm. offer this vaccine to people on some degree of, will discriminate on some basis, and I, you'd have to lay out exactly who you thought you shouldn't get the vaccine mm. on your plans mm. doesn't seem to me something that's operationalizable mm. nor necessarily even desirable but a, a, you know i would go back to the fundamental point that we were really hit by the incredibly powerful testimony from around the country on the areas of deprivation but it has happened everywhere and I, I i would be surprised if any school in your constituencies has had zero disruption and no children affected uh, adversely okay. in terms of their that education. Be made. Have you got the last one, Caroline? Or? Yeah, last one. So, so, are you, so I'll just, just to be really clear on this, if, you, if you're a parent in a rural area with relatively low levels of COVID disruption so far, 
um, who, who, who is white, male, and already certainly had COVID and tested positive for COVID before. Is the vaccine still for that child in their benefit? The vaccine will, will be at a smaller benefit if a child has definitely had uh, COVID in terms of in increasing infection. It's not at zero benefit because it will certainly strengthen the immune uh, response. So this is not a, a, a no effect. Uh, mm. But certainly the people we are most concerned about are those who have not had COVID previously uh, in, in terms of healthier children. But trying to differentiate between that is, is practically very difficult. And in, in, you know, it's not obvious to me what gain you get from this given that actually even at an individual level, benefits marginally exceed uh, harms uh, as JCVI laid out. So I, I just, I think if you try to design a program where you actually said, well, the government refuses to vaccinate the following people, uh, if you actually wrote it down, I think you'd find it quite difficult to actually put something out that both made sense and was, was actually deliverable. And I think at a certain point, you actually, public health is about pragmatism and about actually saying what is in the benefit of, of the people who are most disadvantaged, which is very I'm much our starting point. I guess I just say I'm disappointed that there doesn't seem to be any figure in your, in, your, in your mind, or certainly given to me, of what amount of minutes of time of disruption as an average um, over, the, um, over the school um, children is enough to vaccinate them because you've made your decision based on reducing the amount of school disruption, but you don't seem to have a figure of what school disruption is damaging. Well, I, I think we, we have said that at the top end of the range, 12 million days uh, lost is a very substantial number. At the bottom end of the range, in my view, uh, 110,000 is still a non-trivial number. I don't think t parents listening to this, uh, children listening to this, would say, well, that's nothing. Uh, that assumes that we would not have a surge over and the, the winter. Per, what is that per pupil? Either 15 minutes or four days. Yeah, but the, the, this goes back to the thing, you know, this is, this is not... This, the, the adverse effects of this are not averaged comfortably and equally over every child. If they were, we'd be in a very different situation for the disease as a whole, not just for this. So, Cheryl, let me one last question. If you, if you were to cook captured on a Monday and you get your 10, 10 days isolation, so you've had, you've had sort of eight days off school, um, that's the most... How likely is a child to have to do that? Twice. I'll ask uh, Professor Van Tam wants to answer this. I agree. I think <laughs> Professor Van Tam would be in a good position. Why don't you repeat the question to Professor Van Tam? So, Professor Van Tam. For, yeah, you heard it, Professor Van Tam. Carol, uh, Caroline Johnson's question, presumably. Um, Chair, I, I didn't. I got my hand up to say something else ah, okay. in response to Dr Johnson. Sorry, I, but okay. I'm happy to take her question first. OK, if, if you just uh, thank ask you. it quickly again. Um, thank, thank you, Professor. Um, the most disruption that a child gets, other than, I suppose, missing children from their classroom, is that they have to isolate because they unexpectedly are diagnosed with coronavirus. If they have it, they have a 10-day isolation period, which would include at least two weekend days. They're going to have eight days off school, assuming they're not too unwell with it. So how likely is a child to require that twice? How likely is a child that has already had coronavirus to get it a second time and require to isolate a second time? So we have some data from healthcare workers, which we have studied in great detail, about um, infection and the chance of reinfection. And I would put the likelihood in the range of 5 to 15 per cent. But I wouldn't want to frame the problems of, um, uh, for a child of being um, isolated in a room of their house for 10 days to be confined just to missing four days from school. Um, the children that I know are, um, you know, very focused on their social lives and their leisure and sporting activities that are really critical for them and the highlights of their week, whether it's football training, squash, whatever. And, you know, from that perspective, I think it's a bit broader than that. Okay. So okay. the point I wanted to make to you was that um, whilst I understand the kind of... Um, epidemiological rationale for the idea of a targeted vaccination policy. If one were to do that in relation to areas of high deprivation, which are to a large extent um, areas of high ethnicity, and I have to say this as somebody from an ethnic minority, I think it would um, raise deeply unsavoury um, 
problems in relation to how this pandemic was beginning to be framed in its later stages um, around a problem around uh, related to deprivation and ethnicity, which in my view it is not. It is a problem for all of us until it is um, fixed and we are out the other end. That, that wasn't, if I may, may come back on that, there wasn't, that wasn't the point I was making. The point I was trying to get at is that each parent will need to make a decision for their own child. And when they're making their decision for their own child, they will only consider their own. To, and if, if, if you're talking that we were going to, as you said earlier, um, not look at it for altruistic reasons, but only for the benefit of the individual child. My question then was, is it for the benefit of the individual child if they're of a low-risk child who's already had it, and because they're a boy, a high-risk child of side effects of myocarditis compared <coughs> to a girl? Okay. Can I, can I clarify? Yeah, because, in a nutshell, if yeah, you can. Because, yeah. Just because that wasn't an accurate reflection of what we said, which is our fault for not explaining it properly. We said benefits direct and indirect in that age group. So there will be some benefits to the children around that child, and we consider those legitimate to consider in other children in the same class. What we were not considering and would not consider is the benefits to any other age group other than the one we're talking about. Now, there are, we are confident benefits to the individual children, as JCVI originally said, but we also think there are wider benefits, okay. and that was the point we made. Okay. Um, what, we're just going to move on to Nicola, but can I just ask you, when a parent... I, mean, I asked you about the potential disruption from the vaccination programme itself, and um, you've talked about the 12 million, possibly four days, 12 million days for... Um, a school, Teddington School, in Bourne... Um, it, sorry, in Middlesex, uh, part of the Bourne Educational Trust, they are vaccinating their students and then telling all students to go home from the next day on the Friday the uh, 24th of September to do remote learning. So um, this and their quote from their letter, this allows for any students who are not feeling 100% to work from home for all new year seven students uh, to experience remote lessons for the first time. I mean, surely that should not be happening um, because that's one of the four days um, um, that, um, or however you want to describe it, one of them, uh, uh, and, and for a school to send all their students home after being vaccinated, if that's going to happen across the country, or in a lot of schools, that's going to significantly um, uh, make impact on what you're, one of the reasons why you're saying that the vaccinations need to happen in the first place. Uh, well, I mean, I, I, I'd really like to turn over to Sir Keith uh, on this one, uh, but just before I do, and that's an illustration of the fact that schools don't do exactly as government ex it says on a whole bunch of things, and that's where actually a lot of the disruption can come from, and I think the assumption that government just lays down here are some rules and they're exactly followed. Schools rightly have autonomy, head teachers rightly have uh, autonomy, as I'm sure you as... But you can say as a medical officer there is no need to send every child home. I'll, talk, I'll, I'll ask Keith because he's the person who's responsible uh, overall from the NHS point of view for the programme. Uh, thank you, Chris. So th that is not a part of the policy or that we have laid out with the school age immunisation services, but obviously the head teachers in schools have uh, run those schools and, and can make decisions. The information we have given to schools around the vaccination programme and to address the earlier point, um, the amount of time impacted by the vaccination program um, working with our school age immunisation services is actually very small. When they go into a school, the average secondary school size in the country is 22 pupils. Um, when a vaccination team goes in, um, perhaps the average would be that 10 vaccinators would go in uh, to any one school. And even on the revised figures for COVID, given the fact that there is a longer consent process and a longer um, observation period, each uh, team going in would do about 260 Ooh, vaccinations But will you, will you be day. contacting schools like this? Um, and do you not agree that if schools, are, if this becomes common practice, um, the, the reason, one of the most important reasons that you've given for the vaccination um, will be weakened uh, con considerably because schools will be, uh, thousands of children will be sent home one day, one day or so, whatever it may be? So, Chair, schools have had extensive communication and that has not been part of any of those communications. The guidance to schools does indicate what the common side effects are, and I'm sure all of us uh, on in this call have had a vaccination. So we know the, the sensations that you may get um, and there may be uh, in a small number of people have a uh, some feelings of unwell uh, that may last uh, hours or uh, a day or two. Um, and if they children are 
ill then or unwell, uh, there is a suggestion that those children only um, should rest yeah. and take paracetamol. That is the guidance to schools. There is yeah. no, what I'm nothing more guidance I'm to indicate pass on, a... Thank you. I'm going to pass on to my colleague. I'm just trying to find out what you're going to do to try and stop... I know you've set out the guidance, but to actually you and the DfE to stop this sort of thing going on, because clearly you're saying it's not necessary and that Teddington School in uh, a Broom Road, Middlesex, shouldn't be sending all their students home after vaccinating them for the day. That's correct. Is that correct? That's not, that's not the policy that we have put for now. Right. No. Thank you, Nicola, thank you. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to clarify, um, one of the benefits of vaccinating young people, uh, children, is that they, the young people from lower socio socioeconomic backgrounds are worse off when they have to self-isolate or um, be away from school. Do we have any data on whether those, um, whether young people from those backgrounds are going to be having the vaccine and the uptake is high enough to have that effect, positive effect? Um, if, you're, if you're addressing the question to me, I don't, I don't think we, we have got any evidence about that. I think it, it's, it's, the, it's, you know, we've worked really hard um, as a Royal College to support the information um, leaflets and, and other kind of packs of information, both for parents, schools and children. Um, we've used our consultation with our own children and young people to try and get the language right um, so that it's pitched at the right level. Um, but, you know, we're, we're, we've just started this, um, this process, so I, I'd, I wouldn't feel able to sort of predict... I think what we can say with some confidence is that um, certainly in older age groups, including aged people of uh, parental age for secondary school children, uh, rates of uptake are very high. Uh, so I think that uh, you, know, you can never be sure, even with the uh, relatively recently launched uh, 16 to 17 year old vaccination, uh, over half have already chosen to have it and the numbers are still rising. So I think, uh, you know, let's see. Uh, but uh, because this is very much, uh, people have, uh, you know, families uh, will be choosing, but the evidence so far is in the UK, people uh, fully see the impact of COVID, they fully see the impacts more widely, and people are choosing, certainly in older age groups, to be vaccinated. So I think you know, the only way we can, we can be sure uh, is to make the offer, uh, and then uh, we will see how uh, families uh, respond. Do you have any wider data for the cohorts of people and whether they have been reluctant to take it up? Is this something that you're looking at when it comes to then at this age group? There is a differential, but the majority in every ethnic group, the majority in every geographical area have chosen to be vaccinated at our old, older age groups. Uh, we'll have to see with this. We're not, we're not, you know, we've made it very clear that the risk benefit is a more balanced decision here. We made that explicitly clear that it is in older age groups. But we very much want to make sure that this offer is available and understood equally in all uh, sections of community. We don't want anyone to feel disadvantaged. Just to clarify that, the, this, one of the specific groups of people that you think this programme will benefit, if that group of people aren't having the vaccine, have you got any further plans to deal with it or...? Well, I think that... Um, you're, you're absolutely right that the, the groups who are most likely to benefit are the ones we'd be even most keen to take up the offer if they chose to do so. Uh, and there's already quite significant programmes to try and make sure we reach out to different communities through different communication channels, very much to say, let's tailor the message so that people feel they have tr trusted voices who they can uh, talk to, uh, they can hear from, uh, that are more tailored to particular groups. So uh, absolutely, that should be part of what we're doing, and that's very much part of Keith's, uh, Keith's plans, I know. Keith, do you want to add to that? Um, yeah, I mean, this is something that has uh, been right through the vaccination program since day one, um, working at the very local level. In fact, we now call it the hyper-local level because you have to work with trusted people in the community, with leaders, with teachers, with faith leaders, uh, in order to access the communities that we fail. We now say fail to reach rather than hard to reach because it's an issue for the program. But this is something that has been consistent throughout. And that's one of the reasons why for the 12 to 15 year olds, as I indicated earlier, that we have used the established process because they have access to all children and all the past evidence on vaccination programs is that by using the schools based approach, you reach all the children. And in addition to that, obviously, I've talked about uh, the children who are outside the mainstream education, which are also part of this commission program. Um, Ian. 
Professor Whitty, you, you've explained already the benefits of vaccination to individuals and those closely around them in this age group. But you've also said that the likely benefits of reducing educational disruption on balance provides sufficient extra advantage to recommend in favour of vaccinating 12 to 15 year olds. Now, that's a, a relatively complex message. So how are we going to effectively communicate that to schools, head teachers, staff, parents and children themselves? Uh, thank you. So I'll, I'll have a, a first go, but I'd really again like um, uh, Dr Kingdom and then uh, Sir Keith to come in because they really have to do this on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, of course, the advice that we were giving, although we tried to make it reasonably clear, but it was advice to ministers and it was pitched at ministers. That was very much, we wanted them to understand the logic of what we were saying and indeed parliamentarians to be able to follow the logic of what we were saying. It's then been translated uh, using also information from JCBI and other sources uh, to uh, uh, various forms of documents which are there to try and provide full information uh, in a, an accessible way, uh, both for parents uh, as well as uh, for children of different ages. And maybe Dr. Kim can talk a bit about that, that and then uh, Sir Keith. So I, I think, I mean, it, 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 you've asked a really pertinent question because it kind of gets to the heart of how, how this is actually going to happen on the ground. And it's about having a conversation with a, a child, in, because that, it'll be the, um, the, 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 the um, vaccinator in the school, saying to the child, you know, have you had all the information that um, you've received about this vaccine? Have you managed with your parents to, to reach a decision? Have you got any questions for me? Um, and then working through the questions as, as they arise. But you're right, it's, it's, this, is a, this is a more challenging conversation to be had. Um, but as with any medical intervention, be it vaccination or any treatment, it's about being transparent about what the, be the benefits are and then any, any risks that are evident uh, that, we, that we know about um, and helping the child to understand the balance of the, of the risks and the benefits. And that's a conversation. And it may not be a conversation that can be had on a, on a single day. Um, it may be something whereby you, know, you allow the child to go away and think about it and come back um, and, and you know, Professor Willett, I'm sure, will, will tell us how practically that would work. But, but that's very much been, you know, the the, the, the way in which we would take it forward. And, and likewise, the way in which we would talk to parents. So it's about saying, you know, help me understand what your questions are. Let me see if I can allay any of your fears. Um, you know, let's have a, an honest conversation about what we believe are the benefits for your child um, versus, uh, you know, the risks. I mean. That, that communication issue is obviously vitally important and, and, and I understand that, that, that you've been quoted yourself as saying that the rollout of the vaccine programme for 16 to 17 year olds was at the time frankly shambolic. So um, how are we better prepared now for, for rolling out the vaccine to, 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 the, to this age group from, so, that, um, from that particular juncture? So I, I did describe it as shambolic. That was quite some time ago. Mm -hmm. And I think we've come a huge way since then. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, I think, you know, we've, we've been on a learning curve around how to do this most effectively, um, how to get the information for children and young people in, in the kind of language that works for families. Uh, but, you know, as a Royal College, we've had huge engagement with the vaccines team, NHS England uh, and, the, and, the, and the devolved nations to try and support getting this right. So it was our perception that was shambolic. But as I say, that would not be our op um, opinion now. I think we've, we've come a, a very long way and are far more confident about the position we're in today. Would it be helpful for Sir Keith to also comment? Because He's, obviously he, the, the NHS is delivering this. It's very diplomatic. Yeah. Yeah. Of you, given that you're sitting next Thank to the you. Chief Medical Officer. Mm. Okay. Mm. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, I think, again, going back to the, the programme we are using through the School Age Immunisation Services, they work, uh, have done for many years in conjunction with the local authorities, with the schools, the regional commissions for education, uh, and the directors of public health. So, they know the locality, they know the groups that are particularly difficult to reach. And as part of that, the information that goes out to parents, not only um, does it go out to parents and children, it goes out in accessible versions of 27 different translated languages. There are videos, um, it's in Braille, it's in British Sign Language. So everything is done to try and reach. And in addition, at the time of contacting um, the parents and the child, 
there is an offer made for a direct communication with the school age immunization uh, health professionals to be able to talk through the issues because this is a very personal individual decision and we recognize that in all vaccination programs but probably more so in COVID than any other vaccine we've led before. So all of that is in train and is rolling out um, with, the, with the program starting at, at full strength today. Can, can I also ask, I mean, the, 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 we're now in a situation where adults who were first part of the vaccination program are being urged to get a top up vaccine when that becomes available. So what is likely to be the time span between which a vaccination and a top-up vaccination will be needed in this age group, the 12 to 15 year olds? Uh, well, I'll, I'll give a first version. I'd also be interested in Professor Van Tam's and Professor Lim's views on this. But at this point, uh, all we are recommending is the first vaccine because we think the risk benefit there is the most understood. Mm -hmm. uh, as time goes by, there's, of course, most, uh, most other European and North American countries are ahead of us on vaccinating children of this age. We're accumulating information from them, from their health professionals. We will in the UK as well. So the question even of uh, the second vaccine, we have, you know, we have not yet got to, and we will very much uh, turn to JCVI and to Professor Lim uh, to give the view on, on that. And I think a top up in terms of beyond the second, that's way away in the future for us to consider. And I really don't think that's a bridge we haven't even got in sight, let alone uh, come anywhere near. But uh, JVT, do you want to add to that? And then Professor Lim. Thanks, Chris. Um, so thanks for the question. I think there's relatively little I could add, except to say that there is a big difference between a consideration of the second dose in children, which is a matter that is undecided, requires further data, and JCVI will look at, versus the matter of a third dose, which is a genuine booster dose for those very elderly cohorts, and as, as you know from the announcements moving down the ages, who are going to require um, a, a top up to give them a longer duration of immunity, particularly with this winter in mind. But I would confidently expect that um, the protection afforded to children who decide to take up the offer of the um, first dose of Pfizer will um, last at least until the rest of the winter. Mm -hmm. And a question about whether there will need to be another is a matter that JCVI we'll have to look at in due course when there are more data. And indeed, there may also at that point be even more vaccination product options available in 2022. We have to just kind of wait and see on that. Professor Lim, do you want to add to that? I do, yes, please, thank you. And thanks for raising that. Um, the second dose options for children are, are varied actually. There's just been a trial announced, as you may have heard, of a lower dose vaccine being given, Pfizer vaccine, to children under the age of 12. And that doesn't mean that a lower dose couldn't be used in older age children, nor as a second dose as well. So I think there are a number of options that we need to consider when we come to think about second doses in order to get the right balance of benefit and harm. Uh, we're just not there yet, but we will make those considerations in due course. Uh, I can say that it is uh, not expected that a second dose uh, will be offered before the usual 8 to 12 weeks that we already described for everybody else. So it's not going to be soon, uh, it's going to be sometime later. Yeah. I mean, I represent a constituency in the northeast of England where, during the pandemic, we've at, the, at some time been very high in terms of the incidence of uh, COVID amongst our general population. But given that children can transmit and catch this infection, have you done any analysis and are you concerned of the likelihood of new var variants of developing amongst children themselves, which might actually detrimentally impact from a medical perspective, children themselves? I think it's very difficult, I mean, it's a, obviously a critical question. I think it's very difficult to be sure um, on anything on variants, uh, but I think the probability that a serious variant would occur in children in the UK is relatively low. Now, of course, we've had one bad experience where the alpha variant 
did, uh, was at least first described in the UK. Whether it arose here, we still don't know. Uh, Delta, of course, didn't. But, but in terms of the proportion of the risk around the world, uh, it's really everybody who's potentially infected is at risk. Vaccines will then, in due course, select for particular variants, but they don't make it more likely they'll arise. They do make it more likely they would subsequently be selected for. Uh, and one of the reasons we all believe that uh, this is a problem, every, you know, problem anywhere is a problem everywhere, is because we've got to get the rates right down to reduce the risk that new variants do arise anywhere in the world, whether it's in the UK or, or elsewhere. I mean, I, I fundamentally understand, I mean, and I'm totally on board with the whole idea of vaccinating the general population, but there has been resistance. And, and I, I've got a concern that the very children that we would really want to get a vaccination may be coming from those communities and have parents who have resisted getting the vaccine in the first place. Have we got a magic bullet to, 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 to kind of sort that out? Because it really does seem to me that we're going to have to have intensive public health interventions on a community basis in order to make this work. Uh, if anyone, um, if any doctor believes in magic bullets, they're in the wrong profession. Uh, this is definitely not something that happens. Uh, what I would say is I completely agree with the point you're making. And if I can, through you, just make the point that lead, political leaders, MPs, local political leaders, have huge influence in their local communities. And I think where you see communities that are being left behind in this area, uh, anything that can be done to help make sure that we don't have uh, big disparities obviously is very powerful. I mean, the only other thing is, well, obviously I've, I've watched the, 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 the briefings on the TV with, with interest. And, and is there anything that we can do from a public health perspective to actually sort of dampen down the nonsense which has been transmitted you know about the, you know the, from, from the the, the, the anti-vax groups etc. Because uh, you know I, I'm afraid to say that, that I regard them as a major threat in this being a success. I, I think that I mean I, I'll, I'll give a view, um, uh, which is that the although the anti-vax sentiments are very loudly expressed. I think in the UK they represent a tiny fraction of the population. Now there's a large group of people who have perfectly legitimate questions they want to ask and that's perfectly sensible. People who actually have what I would consider to be anti-vax sentiments, basically trying to persuade other people not to get a potentially life-saving vaccine or at least uh, something which will improve uh, lives of people, they're a minority. Uh, I, I, I do not think highly of them. Uh, I doubt most of the general public think highly of them. They exist, fine. Most people just ignore them. I think that's the best thing to do. Uh, you can usually spot them. The one thing I would say about almost all of them is the three things you want to take advice from is people who are knowledgeable, logical, and kind. And if you read the kind of stuff they produce, it's pretty obvious they're not knowledgeable, they're not logical, and they're definitely not kind. That, that, that's, that's absolutely true, but at the same time, some people are susceptible to, to taking it, being taken in by this stuff, and, and you know, people quite innocently are, are, are now raising questions based on stuff that they've read, I'm afraid to say, on the internet. How, can we not have a much more effective rebuttal system for this nonsense, please? I, I think from the, from the point of view of the public health people, all we can do is lay out as carefully as we can, as we've tried to do in this committee actually, evidence, be fair about it, be really balanced about the way we do it, and I completely agree with uh, Dr Kingdom's views on this. I, I think others are much better at communication than we are, and I think we would very much lie, you know, rely on them. But I would also say there's a strong um, leadership role for political leaders on this, uh, and uh, you know, that's obviously something which this House can do a huge amount about. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I just want to, um, Caroline is on this point, Absana, do you mind just waiting a, a little bit and then Nicola and then I'll bring you in Absana. Abs it is just, just one question because I think the communication is really important and it's really important that when families make a decision they do so with informed consent and we're very familiar with the concept of informed consent as doctors. Um, someone gave me the leaflets that are being given. I don't know whether there's something that you have um, a bit of responsibility for, uh, Professor Whitty, but there's an easy read version and a guide for children and young people on whether or not, that in, in terms of uh, their consent, one's a consent form, one's a consent leaflet for children um, to read before they consider whether they will or not they would have the vaccine for their parents to read with them. Um, both of them talk about coronavirus being an illness that might have deadly consequences, which is fair because it's true. But neither of them say that the effects are marginal or tiny or small or any other word that might be understood by children. Neither of them mention the educational um, rationale at all. Do you think that's fair? 
I think, well, I, 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 although you've generously said I'm, I, I'm responsible, and the answer is actually no, I'm not. Although, obviously, if Curious. I. So, well, I was going to say that the people who can probably answer this best, in fact, are, are Sir Keith. So just to come in on it, as I understand it, it doesn't mention the risks of the. Albeit very minimal, understandably, the minimal uh, of my, myocarditis. That's inc- that's to chair. That's incorrect. It, one it of them does, does. One of them doesn't. So, so what I suggest we do is one we hear from Sir Keith and hear from. I have been Dr. asked Kingdom. this by the, the media so and if, approached if, by parents about it. Well, so I'm glad. I'm glad to say there's some leaflet going all, around which does not mention this one doesn't. Myocarditis. Yeah, all, all all the ones that are aimed, as I understand it, at older children and families explicitly mentioned myocarditis. In fact, what they don't do is say you also can get it from COVID, right. but that's by the by. Uh, and so, but I think it, you know, the, the Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health has been consulted on this. Public Health England has been involved, and obviously Keith uh, has also been involved. Do you want to maybe go first, um, uh, Camilla? Um, yes, so, uh, well, I mean, the, the, the documents belong to, I think, Public Health England or and it, the, the, to the vaccines program. Mm. I mean, we've certainly inputted to support some of the language used um, mm. a, a, and so on. Um, I Certainly the documents I've seen did talk about heart, I think they talk about heart muscle inflammation or, mm. um, you know, some kind of lay term for myocarditis. So certainly I was happy that it had represented the, the risk that I know that, you know, parents, you know, with them, people are focusing on particularly at the moment in terms of one of the risks of the of this vaccine so you 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 the 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 one of the from the UK health security agency and the NHS which is a coronavirus consent form for children and young people does not mention myocarditis or education at all as reasons for covid simply to stop you getting very poorly um, and that's a quote. Um, the COVID vaccination from Public Health England and the NHS, a guide for children and young people, does mention myocarditis and does explain the symptoms, which is good. Um, but again, it doesn't rec- it doesn't recognise that the the health benefit from in, in in terms of weighing up the health benefit that JCI did was small, and it doesn't talk about education. Do you think it should? Uh, Keith, do you want to comment on this? Because it's your programme. So, uh, Yes, thank you. So th- these are documents that are produced by Public Health England in consultation with clinical teams and, as, uh, as Dr. Hume said, the, the colleges. Um, we have those comments. Now, the one I think you're referring to is one that was produced initially for all 12 to 15-year-olds, starting with the at-risk groups and as well as uh, involving more subsequently the, the, the universal offer to 12 to 15s. So I think that may be partly behind uh, the way it's being interpreted i think it just mentions, um, so a, it, mentions just it, mentions a headache or a sore arm it doesn't I, that I, particularly I, it. keith yeah. why don't you finish your comment Sorry. but but i i will come back to that because actually if you you know I've, I've tweeted out everyone else has there's long there's lots of different versions of this depending on age and appropriateness all the ones i've read at least uh do you mention myocarditis specifically keith it's, it's the educational balance that i'm particularly interested in the 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 easy read version doesn't mention myocarditis. I can understand perhaps not wanting to frighten children with learning disability, perhaps that it's intended for. But the neither of them, neither of the guides mention edu- education as a reason. It's all about health reasons, and the health benefit being tiny isn't mentioned either. So I think there are a series, and I think you've you've identified one there that may not. Um, these are, say, uh, produced by Public Health England, and they are uh, distributed through the vaccination program by NHS England. Certainly, the one um, that I have in front of me, which is the one that goes out to schools and to young people, the vaccination program, um, does does deal with that and talks about the various uh, rare serious side effects. So I think. There are a range of information, all of which is available uh, on gov.uk. And as I say, these uh, documents are available uh, in different languages as well. I, be... I can't specifically answer the question without seeing the documents. So, 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 so Keith, would you be so kind as to sort of lift up like that, the one that you have, which does talk about educational disruption? I, well, I'm, I'm trying to, uh, Dr Johnson, I, with, with respect, I've, I've got the seven pages of one version of this, and there are multiple versions of it. Uh, I'm sure we can actually get back to you about Can, can this, I just turn thing. the question around a bit before I pass on to um, Nicola? Could, do you, whatever's gone on on a previous leaflet, do you agree that all leaflets on this issue in terms of vaccinations for 12 to 15 year olds should include um, the issue minimal risk, as has been made, made clear, of myocarditis? All the ones that I've seen, um, which are current, as far as I'm aware, uh, it, in terms of ones where you're actually expecting the uh, children and young people and the adults both to be involved in the decision, 
do mention that explicitly. And interestingly, they don't do it on the side of people who have COVID, which it does happen, as, for example, they don't mention several of the other things you get with COVID. So I think you can't obviously be complete, but all the ones I've seen do mention that explicitly, and usually there's a paragraph about it. Not the one that um, Caroline has. No, it's the, it's the fact that they don't talk about the education being the reason for vaccinating the bots. No, just to the point of the education, yeah. I, I mean, I, I don't know the version you're looking at, but, but we have to remember that we're also immunising 12 to 15 year olds who are at risk. Yeah. Uh, where education, the impact of education wouldn't be, the pro- wouldn't be one of the primary reasons for advocating the vaccine. So actually, it would be entirely correct to not mention um, education in, in that consent setting, because actually you, you're having a conversation with a child who's got, un, you know, f- uh, unstable yeah. asthma or, uh, you know, uh, significant congenital heart disease. So that's an entirely dif- different consent process. It still adds to the um, the reason for doing it, though, doesn't it? Because those children would still miss school, wouldn't they? I mean, it's, it's still it's still a reason. It's not a, it's not a it doesn't not apply. Absolutely. I mean, as with as with any child, um, education is as as big a part of their well-being as, as as anything else. But the imperative to vaccinate the at-risk groups is the driver is different. Okay. okay thank you. Okay, is it um, if, uh, just Nicola Men up, Sarah? Sorry. Thank you. Sorry. Um, well, I agree with Professor Witt's assessment of those who spread COVID misinformation. But I just wanted to go back to the fact that. Um, at the moment, TikTok's algorithms, are, um, the reports that it is promoting misinformation about COVID vaccines, that is something that is going to influence the decisions of this age group that we're looking at. Um, and we also believe that young people are more likely to believe in COVID misinformation as well. Um, so with all this in mind, is there any, are there any plans to reach out to this age group on the kind of platforms that they are seeing this kind of disinformation? Keith, I don't know whether you feel competent to comment on that. I certainly wouldn't. Um... So um, the Department of Health and Social Care leads on the security issues related to uh, information in this regard. Uh, And there is the Malicious Communications Act, which is the legal basis on which they uh, involve the regulatory authorities um, and Uh, the police and action can be taken through that. It's not my area of expertise, but that is our reference point and that is the information that we do give to schools uh, and people involved in this programme. And I would perhaps at this point um, recognise we are talking about security now and this sort of misinformation. Uh, Keith, Keith, sorry, can I just interrupt? um, Because I think the question is slightly different, which is uh, given that there is this misinformation on platforms like TikTok, are there plans to actually, in a sense, also put out the positive messages through TikTok. I think that's correct, isn't it? Yes, your, yes. That was your question. In a nutshell, please. Yes, yeah, so the answer is yes. There is a continuous social media programme that is led uh, between the Cabinet Office, the Department of Health and Social Care and NHS England to put out the positive messages, the truth. Uh, and okay. um, it's not a process whereby you directly challenge the misinformation. Um, because in that the evidence on that from behavioural insight is that it actually provokes uh, an argument and a greater uh, heightening of the uh, the references to it. But it's very important that we do have an equivalent programme, which we Thank do. Thank you. Um, Absana. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to go back quickly, firstly, to a question that was, I think, asked earlier, but it, it didn't mm. seem clear to me in terms of the answer. Where there are cases where there is adverse effects from the vaccine, um, who would be responsible if, if a child is to suffer that, knowing the, the risks that we're already aware of? Keith, do you want to answer that? Uh, you're talking here about the adverse reactions to the vaccine. Yes, so, so who Correct. ultimately is responsible where there are adverse effects to the vaccine? So the, um, the responsibility for the vaccination programme sits with the provider, which is the School Age Immunisation Services. Uh, They carry the liability as an NHS commissioned organisation and we obviously therefore have in place the full clinical responses to deal with adverse events that occur on the day, anything from um, um, fainting uh, through to more serious consequences on the day. Um, They are covered um, through the NHS uh, indemnity scheme uh, and so the liability would sit therefore with that uh, scheme. In terms of heart inflammation in those cases, I mean, What's been the approach there? So again, in terms of the responsibility that would sit with the NHS um, to manage those cases um, and uh, the care of uh, anybody who suffered those complications would sit with the NHS 
uh, the responsibility and the liability. Okay, thank you. Um, in, in terms of, um, we, we as a committee, we've seen a lot of mixed messaging around parental consent for the vaccine. Um, the NHS website explains if a young person refuses treatment, which may lead to their death or severe permanent injury, their decision can be overturned by the Court of Protection. Uh, we've seen in a recent interview with Sky News, um, the Health Secretary said children would get the final say if there was disagreements between them and their parents' preferences. Um, and also the former Vaccines Minister said, um, I think it was to the Times newspaper, that children would only be able to have the vaccine against parents' wishes after a meeting with a clinician. So um, can you explain to us what your interpretation is of how the Gillick test will apply to universal vaccines for children in that particular age group of 12 to 15? Thank you. I think this is a really critical question because I think that I, I completely agree there has been quite a bit of confusion about this. So I'd, I'd like to lay this, I'll lay out the kind of the, the framework and I think it's really probably quite useful for um, Dr. Kingdom to talk about how paediatricians actually would deal with it on an actual basis and then maybe Keith in terms of how the programme would. Um, the framework for how to deal with this has been was laid down by the law lords who were then the Supreme Court back in the mid 80s. So before, in, before I was qualified, some distance actually before I was qualified and most doctors currently practicing uh, were qualified, it's been the standard approach that's been taken ever since then. And I'm going to read, and I've never done this in, before, but I'm going to read it from the, one of the law lords, because I think it's a really clear exposition from Lord, uh, Lord Scarman uh, when he, he gave his judgment back in uh, 1985, it was published in 1986. As a matter of law, the parental right to determine whether uh, their minor child below the age of uh, 16 will have medical treatment ter um, uh, terminates if and when the child achieves sufficient understanding and intelligence to understand fully what is proposed. That's the, that's the legal rubric. Now, actually, and this is the much more important point, in the great, great majority of cases, parents and children agree. And in general terms, the younger the child, the more the absolute assumption would be that if there is a disagreement, actually the parents... Uh, will uh, be the right people to actually turn to for this. But the, the two ends of the spectrum, in a sense, are uh, once you get to 16, there's a general assumption, and once you get to 18, there's an absolute assumption that the person themselves will make a decision, the young person or the young adult will make the decision. If you're talking about children below 12, you really would make an absolute assumption that the parents will make the decision. There is a bit of a sliding scale, but in practice, it's actually very, very rare that particularly at the lower ranges, age ranges, this is relevant at all, because almost certainly there will be agreement either way, and we're not trying to uh, push this agreement between the parents and the children. But Camilla, do you want to add to that? Um, yes. So, um, so in fact, this, this principle would be applied by the school's um, vaccination service in, in all the other immunisations that they're delivering, because remember, they're delivering it to that same age group, the HPV jab, the, some of the booster jab. So, so this, this process of assessing whether the child is competent to consent to the immunisation will be something that they would be very familiar with. Now, um, as Professor Witte said, I think in the vast majority of cases, the child will almost certainly arrive with their parents' consent form, and the, pe the child will want the vaccine, and the parents will have consented to it. I think that, or, or, that the, or, be, the, or the other way. Or, or neither want it. Yeah. Rare it might be, but we're talking about... In, in situations where it's not like that. Well, exactly. So, so, but I think the point is that I think in the vast majority of cases, the child and the parent will have decided, made the same decision. So, so actually, at, at that point, you either give the vaccine because both parent and child have agreed, or you don't because neither have. In the unusual circumstance that a child arrives asking for the vaccine, but they don't have their parents' consent, then I think, you know, then the, the first step that the vaccinator would need to take is to start a conversation with the child to say, tell me a bit about um, what you understand this vaccine, what, you know, what it, what's the point of this vaccine, um, do you understand the, the benefits from the vaccine, do you understand the potential risks from the vaccine, and while you're having that com conversation as the vaccinator, you're essentially making, forming a view about whether the child is Gillick competent or not. Now, if you think they are, and they haven't got their parents' consent. In, in the real world, the next step would be to say, tell me about your mum and dad. How, you know, did you discuss this with them at home last night or over the last few days? What are their views? And they um, ultimately overturn their parents' refusal or can the parents um, overrule their own decision if it's a decision that they, they don't want to have the vaccine? So based on Gillick competence, if the child is Gillick competent and they wish to have the vaccine, um, they have the right to receive the vaccine. 
but that'd be very very rare in that even in yes, that subsection very, very in, it, it, also the younger the age the less likely that is to be the case I think that's a which is which is why I preface it by saying if they're good at competent yeah. um, and, and that, that's much more likely to be in the kind of 14 15 year age group but do you know I mean there are some you know 12 and 13 year olds who have a, a genuine and, and deep grasp of this of, of an issue like this and, and are capable, but so ultimately it's the judgment of the vaccinator. But we were really talking about tiny numbers here. It would be interesting to know maybe from the other uh, members of the panel in terms of how you uh, plan to maybe monitor or kind of evaluate this, this aspect. And again, rare it might be the occasions and, and, and cases. So Keith is really probably the person to talk to about this. Can I, can I just come in on that, just to ask what training the uh, vaccinators have to psychologically assess children for Gillick competency and, and, and would they ask teachers uh, and staff of, of the child is it the G is it the GP and, and what happens just to turn it around if a, if a Gillick competent child refuses to have the vaccine would the parents then be able to overrule their decision and give consent on their behalf no no absolutely not you know the, the thought of sort of holding a child down who's Gillick competent and administering a vaccine against their wishes goes against any child, right, child rights um, argument. So, no, if the child is Gillick competent, they decide whether they do or they don't have it. We know that, that I mean, was not the Gillick uh, competence originally meant to be about safeguarding um, uh, and not uh, appli applicable to a, a fairly new vaccine um, that um, understandably some parents will have issues with? It's, um, the, 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 I, I mean, surely that might, might. I mean, you're not concerned that it will be challenged. Uh, you, because well, although, the, although it may be, you're saying it may not, it won't be rare. You're still giving the power to children to make the ultimate decision. So I think that this has been made to sound in the media as if this is kind of new and big problem about this vaccine. Because I want to go back to my first point. Firstly, incredibly rare, and secondly, this is established law which Parliament has chosen not to change it can choose to if you, you the people who could change this so your side of the table not us <laughs> doctors operate within the legal framework that parliament and the courts give us this is the legal framework that has been identical to the legal framework on which, on which all children's uh, treatment other has been done a, a long long in the tooth this this, this, this would be true for everything and this is basically standard medical practice i'm sure dr johnson would agree with this this is completely standard medical practice and is not changed in, in my professional life, told I'm sure Dr. Johnson's professional life, done. Is that correct? I mean, you'd be. Uh, Sorry, I, I, I just want to bring in that. I'm that feeling when I first qualified, you couldn't refuse. I'm feeling that when I first qualified, you could, you could, they could consent but not refuse. Uh, the, and then that's evolved. It's, no, it's, it's basically the assumption is that children. Yeah. Absana, sorry. And then I'll just want to ask one, one more question. I mean, to, in terms of you just mentioned sort of media and, and sort of some of this being discussed in the media. Just following on from what my colleague asked earlier about social media and, and young people. I mean, what considerations have been given in terms of information circulating there about competency and consent? Um, and, and is that something that's that's already been sort of looked into? But my view about this is unfortunately a lot of this is completely inadvertently actually circulated in the mainstream media because mm -hmm. I think this has been understood as in a different way to the reality. So what we're trying to do is as professionals lay out actually how we operate the law which has been the law for you know decades. This is just how it operates. So we're trying to in a sense we're trying to combat that through you by being really clear what the law and the law isn't but what it what you know the very most important point is this is incredibly rare um, just a very quick question on this um Gillick, you're um, on next anyways you've got all your questions for Gillick, yeah. for Gillick uh, competence i'm just trying to practically understand the steps involved so say if i you know i was a 14 year old uh, and my mum and dad were like right tom you haven't it and i said actually no, i don't want it um so what would be the next step so would I have a one-to-one -one meeting with the vaccinator before the jab is planned, or would it be just before the jab? Um, what sort of questions would I be subject to? I think uh, I suggest that Dr. Kingdom, as she does it day to day, and then uh, Sir Keith, because he's responsible for the programme and the two best people to answer this one. So I, I think the, the, the crucial thing here is this is a, a process. So we would never expect this to be a single conversation where there was a disagreement. So you, you, you know, you could imagine it's a school that's administering the vaccine, you're called in. Um, well, it might be that 
children are asked to, I mean, Sir Keith will have to tell us the sort of practicalities of exactly how this, this happens, but clearly if there's a difference of opinion between the child and the parents, there is an opportunity in private to discuss it with the vaccinator. It might be that the vaccinator may choose to call the parents to clarify some of the points. And I think in the real world, where there was, it was, there was clearly a difference of opinion between the two, you would give some, share some additional information, answer any questions that either the child or the parent had, and you may very well opt to not proceed any further on that day, but suggest that the child is given another opportunity at a, at a future date. Hence why I said it's a, it's a process. So this idea that on a day, everyone's got to be sort of but, all lined up. But that sounds like it's a bit like a process to eventually convince the young person in question, question to, have the, to, have the, to have the vaccine. If they are gillick competent, surely that's a key thing. And if they are gillick competent, they should be able to say no. And there shouldn't be an assumption that it's going to be this long process and eventually they're going to say yes. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. If, if the child is absolutely clear they, they do, they, and they're competent that they're not going to have the vaccine, then, then you can draw a line under it. Is it is but it, but I, I suppose, you know, we are not in the business of driving a wedge between children and their parents. So the door is always open. Yeah. If parents wish to have more information, or any party needs to more information, then, then we would be absolutely um, keen to do that. But think, think, I've got, I've got, I've got a, another question <laughs> here about the... I understand in June 2020, June this summer, the MHRA um, approved the Pfizer uh, uh, vaccine for 12 to 15 year olds, um, and that the, the chief detective said that you know it was safe for use, etc. There's a three month, I think about a three month gap between the MHRA making that approving it, uh, and then the um, JBCI um, um, making their making, making their recommendation, and then um, Professor um, um, Whitty making his recommendation. Was it? What was the reason for the, the time lag? And um, um, comparing us with other countries, did they have a similar time lag between their, like for example, you know, EMA and their recommendation, and then their equivalent of JCBI making their recommendation? And then you. So, so the, uh, it's important to understand, and I think it'd be useful to get Wei Shen's uh, view on this as well as chair of JCBI. Um, but it's important to understand the sort of the relative, relative importance of the relative sort of sequencing of things. MHRA had to make the decision as about whether benefits exceeded risks. And they made that decision early on. But uh, what all of us have said all along, including me, is this is always going to be more difficult in children than in adults because the risks to children of COVID are lower than in adults. So the risk-benefit becomes more balanced, inevitably. What, then, what MHRA do, do not do, though, is then say you should then deploy it widely. And that decision about deployment is normally uh, taken, and indeed in this case was taken, but with an important caveat, which is why uh, I and the other CMOs got involved, by JCVI. And Wei Shen can talk a bit more about the JCVI process. Now, it is true that several other countries went faster than we did. Uh, and indeed, they've already started vaccinating the second vaccine for things, so the US, several European countries, and indeed countries elsewhere. So, so we're actually, in terms of uh, speed at which we've moved on this, we've been much more careful and uh, cautious about the way we've approached it than many other nations have, because we recognise that this is a more balanced decision than it is in the older people. But JCVI is much more involved in the actual deployment questions. MHRA is starting off with the question, is it safer to have it than not to have it overall? And if they'd said no, we wouldn't even have got to first base. So, so in a sense, they have to say yes first. This is a safe relative. It's always a relative thing. Safety is not an absolute, but it's safer to have than not have in this group. That was their judgment. They have the legal responsibility. JCVI have the responsibility then to talk about deployment. And ultimately, uh, in this situation, the CMOs are kind of third um, uh, umpire in this situation. But do, do you want to explain how JC JCVI got involved, uh, Wei Shen, and how they thought about it? Yes, thanks. Um, it is quite a complicated process. MHRA uh, do not approve things on their own. They have to be approached, presented with the right information and only when they're approached do they approve something um, if they're never approached they will never approve anything that's the first thing to say so their timing is based on when they are asked a question when they approve something that means that something can be used jcbi has to decide how that thing might be used in this case we're talking about vaccines so jcbi's role is to decide if something can be used a vaccine how should that vaccine be used to maximize or optimize population health? And that may mean we use the vaccines in different ways in different age groups, for example. Uh, the process that we take then is to decide deliverability 
as well as uh, scientific benefit to the population. For young children, that is complicated, and we actually put out a series of uh, advice or statements over time, as you will know. And these uh, bits of advice came out at different points from July onwards. Uh, if we're given the advice earlier in June, operationally, we wouldn't be vaccinating 12 to 15 year olds in June anyway, because the program was still driving at pace through the other age groups. So there is a balance between going too soon and giving advice that is premature almost, <coughs> without the available information. The more appropriate the information is, uh, perhaps the longer it might take to get the right information uh, ourselves before we can give the right advice. So there is a balance of not going too quickly with the advice as well as not going too slowly. Because I mean, when we look at some I of the other, uh, other similar European countries, I think Spain has now, um, uh, between 12 and 18, I think 79.2% of 12 to 18 year olds have had at least one dose in France at 68%. Italy, it's 62.4%. Germany, it's quite a bit less. It's 36.7%. We know, I think, US and Canada started in May. I, I can understand the reasons for you know wanting to maybe take a bit longer, but it does seem a long time, the gap. And, and, and I can see the advantages in those other countries being much further ahead. You know, going into the autumn season, they, they, they've advanced, and, and, and those benefits of us making this decision would have accrued and, and would be making themselves felt as that age group are more protected from COVID. I mean, do you think it is regrettable uh, that we haven't been able to, one way or another, get ourselves to a similar position? I think, I think that, as you probably would have recognised from commentary in the press and elsewhere, there are people who think we should go, have gone faster. Definitely there are a group of very sensible, credible, professional people who think we should go faster, and there are people who think we should go slower. Uh, what we've tried to do, and as I said at the beginning, is take a kind of what we think is the midpoint of the medical profession's view based on our current understanding and informed by what's happened in other countries. So the fact they've gone ahead of us means we've benefited from their fantastic science and their information in the decisions both that JCVI took and indeed which uh, the CMOs are able to take into account. Now, I, I don't think there's a right answer to this. What we've tried to do is stick in the middle of what we think is professional opinion, and I think that is the view also, I, I'm looking at Camilla here, of the uh, presidents of all the Royal Colleges and, as I say, the reps of public health. They feel comfortable. We've kind of we've tried to get this as a balanced decision. But the midpoint of um, scientific opinion in this country seems like it may well be different from the midpoint of scientific opinion in other European countries. In a, in, a, in, a, in a new pandemic, we're all yeah. moving at very slightly different speeds. In some areas, we've gone faster. Mm. Uh, and in some areas, indeed, for example, JCVI's advice on extending dose interval, mm. which the CMOs completely agreed with, we were actually ahead of virtually everyone else. In other areas, we've been slower. That's inevitable. This is a new pandemic. We're all learning as we go. Just a f final, final well, quick question. But so I think with the, sort of, the USA uh, and Canada, I mean, they, they started um, with this age group, I think, in May. I mean, that's quite a long time ago. Surely we've had enough time, um, you know, yeah, no we had more than enough time to sort of look at, look at their data and come to, come to an assessment and get going more quickly. With the, uh, uh, I, I suspect if you took a straw poll around even your, this table here, there'd be a range of views as to whether we were going too fast or too slowly. And as I say, what we've tried to do yeah. is stick to the middle of what we think is the medical opinion in the UK based on current data. And, you know, there are, there are arguments. This, these are finely balanced arguments, and we fully accept the arguments in either direction. People want to go fast or slow. Wei Shen wanted to come in. I don't know who wanted to add to that, Wei Shen. Uh, yes, I want to just draw two points. Firstly, you said that MHRA approved the Pfizer vaccine in June, and that is correct. JCVI concluded its initial discussions on vaccination for 12 to 17 year olds uh, on the 2nd of July, uh, and that was uh, handed up and then publicly released on the 19th of July, so pretty soon after MHRA approved those vaccines. A very strong difference between the UK and other countries is that we deliberated on whether we could identify from a health perspective children who were at higher risk of COVID-19. And we targeted those children first for the vaccination program. So they were offered vaccination very, very early on in July. If you look at many other countries uh, and their risk-benefit calculations, they have lumped together children who are at higher risk and children who are at no higher risk. And that makes a big difference. So I think um, one needs to just be careful about comparisons across countries uh, without being aware of how our own country is faring 
and how our vaccine program has been deployed. Uh, by far uh, and away, the biggest benefit, health benefit from vaccination is with adults and getting as many adults vaccinated as possible must be the priority if one to save lives. Thank you for all for your responses. I mean, I was just, um, I appreciate your re um, reasoning for making the decision that you made. I was just str stressing and pushing some of the arguments. Yeah. Have you finished yeah, completely, yeah. Tom? Yeah. 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 Um, could, could, uh, I, I'm sorry if you've got some more questions or, no, or, or, or not. Does anyone else? Oh, you have another question. Just Thank you. one quick question. Just following on from what Professor uh, Whiten said about um, the fact that we're, we're, we're slightly, uh, you know, the, the other country, other countries have already given um, some vaccines, and that enables us to look at the side effects in a much broader number of people, which is which is beneficial really for us. Um, Adam Finn, paediatrician, um, wrote in the Sunday Times, he's a member of your JCVI committee, um, that the high proportion of the myocarditis, myocarditis patients showed significant changes of the heart. And it's perfectly possible these will resolve completely over time, but it's also possible that they may not. Um, what trials do you are you aware of ongoing in, into this small group of children? And it is a very small group of children and a very low risk. But what, what trials are ongoing and what... Um, efforts are being made in the UK to uh, be ready to recruit any such patients into a trial so that we can look at them more closely in this country too. And I turn to uh, Professor Van Tam, but just to make a comment on my own before that, it is also important to remember we don't know what the long-term effects of catching COVID are in children. No, I agree with that. <laughs> so, no, no, I completely accept that. So I think let's, we need to keep, as with all these things, these are balanced decisions. Yeah. They're not, they're, the risk is not all on one side. And we, we have to, all of us need to be very careful. We, we put the balance, uh, balance on the table. Uh, JVT. Uh, thank you. So we are already aware of the need for there to be some form of research um, that looks and follows this cohort which is a very tiny cohort um, of patients. And um, that work is underway. There are no decisions yet about what is the best or the right study. On top of that, I would um, want to draw to the committee's attention, if they have not already seen it, um, the um, preprint paper, and that means it's not yet peer reviewed, from Adel Singer and colleagues in uh, the University of Cleveland, um, where the point that Professor Whitty was making about um, myocarditis um, occurring as a result of COVID-19 infection, um, that, that paper draws the conclusion that in uh, young males, um, uh, 12 to 15, the likelihood of myocarditis after COVID-19 infection is sixfold higher than is the case uh, related to the administration of the first dose of vaccine. Now, that is, um, we, we can argue all together um, about case definitions and so forth in that paper, um, but it, the comparison between the two uh, from the same data source is important here. And, and my judgment is that even if that figure of sixfold is not, not absolutely correct, that is not going to diminish to something that is close to unity unless the data are incredibly badly flawed. Uh, so from that perspective, I think that's an important um, paper that ought to be looked at by the committee. Thank yeah, you. Um, Professor Van Tam, is there a, um, is, are these children in the UK, that presumably there are, there are quite a few of them now, if it's caused by COVID and by the va potentially by the vaccine in the future, um, are those children who have had myocarditis in the UK being entered into any clinical trials or being asked to be entered into any clinical trials so that we can look really closely at what, what it is that's happening there? So um, to go back to my original answer, the numbers that the, M the MHRA have so far received reports of are incredibly low and um, uh, we are looking at um, studies that might be able to follow those children up but I don't think it would be a clinical trial as such because one would need to have a specific intervention to evaluate in a trial and I don't think we're talking about that I think we're talking about following up those children. Could, could, I, could I ask if, if you have a scale of those numbers we think one and a half million children in this age group have had COVID already, what sort of numbers of children have had myocarditis? Yeah, so I can give you from the MHRA uh, paper, 
um, and this is um, data current up to the 14th of September 2021. Um, and the information I have is that under the under 18 years of age for first dose Pfizer, and this is what we're talking about, the rate is uh, the rate of reported suspected myo or pericarditis. And these are um, spontaneous yellow card reports. Some of them will not be substantiated. Mm -hmm. Some of them will have no ECG evidence and so forth. We're definitely seeing that. But that number is 0.9 per 100,000 doses administered in the under 18s. Sorry, the, the, what the question I was asking was the um, number of children in the UK who've had myocarditis recently as a result of COVID itself. Because we think one and a half million of these children in this age group have already had it. So what, what, uh, what are we looking at those? Are we looking at those children? Yeah, we. we, we right. Sorry. We, the answer, short answer, is we will be, but we don't have the data yet. And, and I think that 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 is a critical question because is it right, as um, Professor Van Tam said, uh, that we can replicate the fact that the rates of myocarditis are higher in COVID infection than in vaccination? And I have to say, my own view is there's a high chance that will be true. Mm -hmm. And then the second question, which is critical, which you're, impl you're rightly set implying, yeah. is what's the long-term implications of this? Because as you know, most cases of myocarditis, or whatever cause, just get better. Uh, and uh, you know, it is possible these will be different from other causes of myocarditis, but it, I have to say my own view is it's, I start off with it's improbable, let's see, must look, must follow this up, must study it, and it has certainly been done in the US and we will certainly aim to do it here. Uh, and at that point, if there is a reason to do a trial, then we could do a trial, but that's the next stage along, I think. I was just wondering if you had any figures on the number of children who've had myocarditis recently. As no, we don't, at this point we don't, that I think we could, I would feel confident to actually put into a public domain discussion okay. like this. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Just, we we finished? Yeah. yeah. So just, just, to, just to ask some concluding questions, we should finish hopefully in five minutes. I know you're very, all very busy and it is genuinely appreciated. Given that um, you know, most adverse uh, events go unreported, how do you plan to monitor the adverse events if there are significant ones in this age group? And uh, what, what steps are you taking to monitor it? Okay, well, I'll give, I'll give a view from my side, and I think it'd be useful to get a view from the paediatric side. I think that um, monitoring the side effects of vaccines, if they're signif clinically significant, th we're likely to pick them up. Because if they're clinically significant, they'll go to a GP, they'll go to a paediatrician. And the time sequence with, I had a vaccine on Monday, and I've got this problem on Friday, will be really obvious, because people know when they've had the vaccine. Actually, the more difficult ones, and this goes back to Dr. Dr. Johnson's very good question, is uh, the people who've actually had COVID, because a lot of children who've had COVID don't know they've necessarily had COVID. We don't actually know that for sure. So the denominator is a lot harder, whereas it's much easier to say, I definitely, you know, people will go back and say, what happened the last week? The answer is, I had a vaccine. Ah, I need to think about it. So I think it's going to take a, a while for us to be absolutely confident. But I mean, paediatricians will be collecting these data, as will GPs, and it takes a while to accumulate them in a way we trust. And that's the point. What we don't want to do is shove out data and then end up... Just, just, just before you come in, Bill, can, can the public access age-specific data on the vaccination programme and the yellow card system? Is that age strati stratified? If you're T, do you want to answer that one? JVT? You've gone mute, He's Thomas. Travelling to unmute us. I beg your pardon, I missed that question. All oh, right, so the question was about age stratification of yellow card data, JVT. Yeah, I mean, is the, uh, can, the, I, the, can, I, the, can the public uh, access age specific data on the vaccination programme? And is the yellow card system age stratified? I don't have. I, I'm, I'm unable to answer that question. So it, it, the answer is, it is age stratified. My understanding is that it goes out but with a time delay because they want to quality assure it. So it's, it's less in real time than the <coughs> overall data, is my understanding. But if you want a chapter and verse on that, we can write back to this committee with that. Okay. But the aim would be for, you know, yeah. yellow card data is yeah. public domain data. Um, there's no, there's no, in, you know, there's absolute intention okay. that these data are Just before I bring in Ian, have you seen the, the data from other European countries which have rolled out the vaccine? to children and if so can you make it public and if there are comparators because obviously some European countries are doing this kept the schools are fully open so it's hard I understand that it will be hard but if there are similar comparators are you able to model what the um, less disruption there's been in 
um, in those school in those countries which have had the uh, vaccination for children. I, mean, I think the first is an easier answer than the second. Right. Uh, on the first one, obviously, if the data is given to us in confidence by another country, we can't publish their data without their permission. That would be very odd. But the absolute tradition in medicine is to publish everything. So, I mean, there may be a bit of a delay between us seeing it and it being in the public domain. I would completely expect it to be in the public domain. School disruption, though, is, not, is much harder to measure, actually. And also, the way in which different schools respond in different countries is more difficult. So I think uh, the honest answer to that is it'll be quite quite difficult for us to put a number on it, but we will certainly try and learn the lessons from other systems, albeit accepting they have different systems as well. Um, Ian, on this point, I've got just, one final question. Just, then, Ian. just, just quickly, I mean, obviously the, the point that Tom was making earlier on is that, that other countries um, are ahead of us in terms of vaccinating this particular age group. Uh, are we learning any lessons about uh, any potential uh, clinical side effects from those other countries? And are we um, asking GPs to very quickly report any incidents of clinical side effects up the chain, as it were? So I think the answer on both ones, I'll give a, I'll give a, a, a yes. Uh, on the first, it's an unqualified yes. I mean, the whole, in a sense, one of the benefits JCVI has had uh, over um, some other nations is that many, uh, many countries are ahead of us. Uh, and they've benefited both from published data, obviously, but also unpublished data uh, and data from the regulators that they get in confidence and indeed from companies. So, uh, yes, we have learned from them and we will continue to learn from them. So, in, you know, the decision that JCVI takes on a second dose, if they decide to go for one and if so, what dose, that will be very much informed by other nations' areas. Uh, GPs in the UK have a strong tradition of using the yellow card system. They all know how to use it. Uh, and they would definitely be expecting, I would expect them professionally, uh, to report anything suspected or definite. I think we'd want to have, in a sense, you'd rather overcall it and then test the data than undercall it. So that would be a professional expectation I would certainly have. I'm sure the heads of the uh, Royal College of General Practitioners would agree uh, if they were here that that's an expectation they would have, uh, as is normal medical practice. Uh, we haven't sort of written out to say specifically do it, but then that would be the norm. That would absolutely be the norm with any new drug or vaccine. And, and, the, and in that reporting mechanism, so what would the route that that would take from a GP? Would it be direct, directly back to whom? What would it be to the CCG? Or so the, the, there's kind of, in a sense, there's two, two routes this will get there, or maybe even three. Yeah. There's the formal route via yellow cards to MHRA, which is the custodian of all of it and should be the final common pathway. Right. And their job is to rule how definite this is and put the numbers in, have a proper denominator. There'll be da data we will pick up from indirectly from... Uh, records, records information, particularly from hospitals, as hospital uh, systems uh, data. And then the academic community is obviously heavily engaged in this and they will independently uh, be analysing us by different routes. So there's quite a lot of different ways we can triangulate it against one another, but the formal route is a major Just um, Thank you. I, I do apologise, my colleague Caroline wants a, a further question, but just the JCVI said that the vaccine programme could have an impact on the efficiency of the rollout of flu. Uh, programs um, vaccines what is the latest state of play on on that is that still the case or, and is it going to have any impact on any, any other uh, ongoing vaccine programs for children Keith is the right person to answer this uh, thank you so on children the uh, flu vaccination program for children this year has been extended as people may know to wider age groups that program that has already started, that started from early in September uh, and will run through to the 31st of January. The uh, COVID vaccination program in schools, uh, in England we are, we are planning to have all invites, um, the consenting material and the date for vaccination out to every child, every family um, before the half term, the autumn half term. So this is a much quicker, faster process. While it runs, there is an opportunity for co-administration. So flu vaccination can be given at the same time as COVID. And in order to do the COVID, we have massively enhanced the capability of the school age immunisation services and made available to, to 20,000 full-time equivalent workforce. So although there will be a interface, uh, we do not anticipate a substantial interference with the flu programme in children. Right, so you're saying it won't impact on other vaccination programmes? It won't impact on uh, the other vaccination programmes tend to run over a much longer time okay. scale. Um, okay. In uh, response to the request to move this programme very quickly, 
the COVID programme, as I say, is being run over a matter of six to eight weeks. I, I, I'll, I'll, can I slightly add to that, Keith? It won't impact from a clinical point of view. It may make some operational difference. But an HPV vaccine, for example, uh, in, in a child, you wouldn't expect whether it's one week or another makes much difference. So, so, it's, it's a, so it, I, mean, I, just, I agree with Keith, but I just want to make sure that people are aware there may be some sh shuffling around of exactly in which sequence things are done. What's the timescales for all this? How, when, when are we likely to know what the take of the vaccine is uh, when it's completed? Um, whether or not it's been successful. In terms of we will have data coming through on the uptake uh, within uh, a matter of uh, days operationally and within uh, a few weeks in terms of public reporting, um, and that will give us a figure comparable that we can look at. Uh, in terms of the effectiveness of the vaccination on the wider case rates and others, I would defer to uh, Professor Whitty. I mean, I, th I think that the trouble we have is it's not a big randomised trial. So there's a certain amount of, because this is a, 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 a disease that is in very high rates at some times and not in others, it, you can't make an absolute comparison. But uh, Public Health England and academics will look at this quite carefully and make, a, and make a best guess based on data, a best estimate of what the impact has been. Uh, my broad view would be the bigger uh, the surge we get in winter, the bigger the positive effect of the vaccination will be. So if we had almost no COVID from here on till March, then inevitably the impact of the vaccination programme would have been smaller. Were we to have, which we may well do, we just don't know, uh, a significant surge over winter in the flu season, I have to say most people would say that's more rather than less likely, then the impact of the vaccination programme will be quite considerably greater. So it's going to depend what, also what the epidemiology is. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to ask you one question that I realise we hadn't covered, but some parents will be wondering. Um, what were the medical reasons that there wasn't an advisory, um, an advice to give the, um, to do some testing beforehand? So knowing that half of children have already had COVID, why not advise an antibody test and then vaccinate those who don't already have antibodies? Well, I mean, I'll give a practical answer, but I'd be interested in, in, uh, in Dr. Kingdom's view, and actually, indeed, yours as a paediatrician. In a sense, what that would mean is taking blood, and then half the people then subsequently vaccinating them. Uh, and I'm break, not sure it? that sounds to me like a thing a child would willingly choose to do, two jabs rather than one in half the case. But uh, that, that would be the practical answer. In practice, the antibody test that they send out for the for the studies is a finger prick, isn't it? Like 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 a sort of diabetic would use to check their blood sugar several times a day, including diabetic children. So I appreciate some children might not like it, but it, it's not it's not a blood sampling, is it? Well, that is blood. Um, no, but it's, it's not it's not it's not taking a whole syringe worth with it with a needle no. syringe. It's, it is just the, the prick of one finger. True. I have to admit, having been both vaccinated and I have finger pricks, I prefer being vaccinated. Finger okay. pricks, you have many more pain receptors than you think you do in, uh, okay. in your arm. But, from a, but from, a, from a not practical point of view, but from the um, risk-benefit point of view of the vaccine? You, you could do a theoretical argument that if you could be confident that you knew someone's zero status, that you could risk stratify. But the, you know, in reality, the practicalities actually are important. And in fact, even if a child had already had COVID, that's not a reason not to vaccinate them. The benefits will reduce to some degree, uh, but it will still strengthen their immune system and probably prolong it. I mean, do you want to add to that? No, um, uh, no I mean, only to say that I can't, Im you know, as a paediatrician, the thought of advocating a two-step two -step approach of two, potentially two, you know, um, needle, you know needles, uh, and uh, that would be deeply unpalatable, I think, to most children and most, and most parents. So, I think if we are being, if we are serious about the the, the broader benefits of this vaccine program, we need to make this as easy as possible. And so, adding in an extra step like that, I, as a, as a, as a paediatrician, and just thinking practically, um, I just can't imagine that um, being a sensible route. Essentially, so practical reasons. Okay. Um, is there anything you uh, want to say finally to? parents, we've said quite a lot publicly already, but is there anything you want to say as we close the session? Well, I think the first thing is to, uh, we're very actually grateful to the committee for the opportunity to lay this out because I think it's allowed a much more kind of detailed discussion of what are really, you know, quite complicated issues, so we're grateful for the thing. I think to uh, parents as a whole, I would go back to uh, actually Professor Lim's view as put by JCVI. It is important for people to realise 
that the risks of this vaccination are very small. Uh, the risks of COVID also are small, but our view is that even at an individual uh, level, benefits <coughs> exceed risks, as JCVI said. And additionally, we do think it has wider risks in, sorry, wider benefits uh, in the population 12 to 15, which is why we recommended it to <coughs> ministers to be offered. But ultimately, it is an offer. And ultimately, this is something, of course, which uh, parents uh, with children will be making decisions about. And it's an offer. And I want to stress that, really. Thank you, Camilla. And I don't know if the other professors want to say anything, Camilla. I think um, the, the, the most compelling message I got was listening to the children and young people that we, we um, interact with at the Royal College. And, and their message was, was very much about choice. Um, and being offered the opportunity to understand the, the risks and advantages <coughs> in an in a, in a age-appropriate but sensible and coherent kind of way. So I think choice is important, um, and, and in addition to everything else that Professor Witte has already outlined. Um, any, any of the other professors at all? Uh, no? Or the JCVI uh, professor, no? Uh, I could just add to what Professor Witte said. Can you speak a bit louder, please? Sorry. Oh, sure. Sorry. If I could just add one more thing, which is to encourage 12 to 15 year olds and their parents, where the 12 to 15 year old has an underlying condition, is at higher risk of COVID. There is no doubt that in our minds, those children are at higher risk, and the benefits of vaccination clearly outweigh the risk on a health ground. Uh, quite apart from any educational benefits. Uh, okay. Those people should step up if they offer the vaccine, if possible. Thank you. Okay, thank you very, very much. Um, it is really appreciated. Uh, thank you again, as I said at the beginning, for your service um, and all that you are doing, and appreciate you coming to our committee uh, for scrutiny, because uh, we have to ask these questions. And I wish you all uh, well. Um, sorry that it went over partly because of a vote, but uh, thank you. Order, order. Thanks. Committee Room 16, Sound. Committee Room 16, Sound. Committee Room 16, Sound.